Hey, Revelstoke Alliance Church. Glad you could join us online if you weren't able to make it into the church on Sunday. So Mark chapter 1 and verse 1 reads, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now today, we're starting a brand new sermon series on the gospel of Mark. Uh, the gospels are four different books, all divinely inspired, written by four different people, writing two different audiences, but all writing about the life and the death of Jesus Christ. It's through these Gospels that we know all about Jesus. And so as we make our way through this book of the Bible, we will start to see clearer and clearer who Jesus is and who knowing Jesus is, is vital to every single aspect, to everything we do in our lives. So this sermon is the intro sermon. We're just going to set the groundwork for the rest of the sermon series. And we're going to look at a few things today. We're going to look at who was Mark? Who's the author of this, the Gospel of Mark? Who is Mark? We're going to look at, secondly, to whom and when and why he was writing. Who was he writing it to and why was he writing it? Uh, three, we're going to look at what is a gospel? What is a gospel? And fourthly, we're going to look at why does it matter to me today, any of these things. So first of all, uh, who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Who was Mark? It's a good question. Now, the original manuscripts don't include the name of the person who wrote this book. Not like many of Paul's letters, for example, that start out or end with a greeting like, I, Paul, greet you in the church in Corinth. So we know that Paul wrote it. It's right in the manuscript. Uh, this manuscript didn't have the name of the author on it. Uh, none of the Gospels did. However, as the four Gospels of Jesus were collated into one volume, early church leaders labeled each of the Gospel according to who wrote them. And thus the authors were identified early on as being Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But Mark who? None of the 12 disciples were called Mark. So who was Mark? Very early church tradition has it that this Mark is none other than John Mark, who we have met in our sermon series in the book of Acts. You might remember the incident where Paul and Barnabas take John Mark with them on a missions trip. John Mark bails on them halfway through. And when they return, and they purpose to go on a second missions trip together. Barnabas wants to bring John Mark again. Paul absolutely does not want to bring him. So they end up arguing like fiercely over this. And the ministry team of Barnabas and Paul split up. Barnabas goes off with John Mark to preach the gospel. And Paul teams up with Silas instead. Later on in the epistles we read that once Paul is in prison in Rome that John Mark and himself have reconciled and that John Mark is in Rome with him again doing ministry, looking after Paul when he was imprisoned. And again, early church tradition has it that when John Mark is in Rome doing ministry with the imprisoned Paul, he takes the opportunity to sit down with Peter, one of the main disciples, and he writes down Peter's recollections of Jesus' life and ministry. So empowered and inspired by the Holy Spirit, John Mark served in ministry with Barnabas, Peter, and Paul, is in Rome and starts writing down Peter's memories and interactions with Jesus. So in some ways, this is the gospel according to Peter is told to John Mark. So that's uh, who John Mark was and uh, how he gathered the information to write the gospel. Now, to whom and when and why was he writing this book? That's another very good question. The gospel most likely was finished sometime around 65 AD, very shortly after the Roman persecution of the Christians had started in Rome under Emperor Nero, uh, after both Peter and Paul were killed for their faith, but before Rome marched an army into Jerusalem and burnt it, including the temple, right to the ground. So Christian persecutions, Nero is insane and he's targeting Christians. He's killed both Peter and Paul. Uh, Rome hasn't marched their army into Jerusalem yet, but that's only a few years away. Right in that period is probably when John Mark wrote this gospel. Now, just imagine, if you can, Nero in his full state of madness, feeding Christians to the lions in the Colosseum, dipping Christians in tar and setting them alight at night to illuminate his gardens. Both Peter and Paul, the main leaders in the church, executed perhaps even on the same day, as part of sweeping persecu persecutions, can you imagine just exactly how the Christian community in Rome particularly was feeling? Now, much of Mark's gospel focuses in on the humanity of Jesus and the frailty of his disciples. 
And yet, a lot of it is concerned with offering comfort and courage and counsel to Christians suffering violent persecution. Additionally, little interesting fact, this was the first of the four Gospels to be written. So it's the oldest of the four Gospels. So the chances are, is that John Mark, writing a Holy Spirit-inspired Gospel using previously written short versions of Jesus' sayings and teachings, along with the recollections of Peter, who was an eyewitness to all the events of Jesus' life and death, he was writing this Gospel to Christians in Rome who are under incredible persecution from a mad emperor who has recently killed thousands of Christians, including Peter and Paul. So that's the sort of the, the context, the setting of the gospel. But what exactly is a gospel? Another great question. Now, before I answer that, and I will come back to it in a moment, um, I want to give you just a very brief history of the Roman Empire. I know that sounds a bit of a oxymoron, a brief history of something that lasted like a thousand years. But let's see if we can just cover like the first 500 or so years of the Roman Empire, 700 years of the Roman Empire um, in just a few minutes, just sort of briefly touching on a few key events. So Rome, uh, the city, was founded in 753 BC. Uh, The tribes that made up the city of Rome were initially ruled by a single king. Romulus was the first king, and that monarchy lasted for 244 years. And then the last king was called Tarquinius Superbus. He was the, what a great name. Tarquinius Superbus was uh, the last king. So 244 years, Rome was a monarchy ruled by a king. In 509 BC, Rome overthrew their king and adopted an elected republic. Now, only those of the landowners, the equestrian class, could be elected initially as a senator. Eventually, Rome grew in power uh, economically and militarily. The middle class, the businessmen, the skilled craftsmen, etc., they grew in stature and power and wealth. And their class, the plebeians, fought and succeeded in getting some of them elected to the Senate as well. So now we've got this democratically, semi-democratically elected Senate making the decisions. Now, meanwhile, as this is uh, moving forward, that's politically, uh, militarily, the Roman army with its legion formation and iron swords, an incredible system of roads, started to conquer other nations around them. Greece, modern-day Turkey, Egypt, Israel, North Africa, all fell under the power of the Roman army. Now, you may have seen, uh, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, I just rewatched this. I preached this sermon on Sunday. I'm recording this on Thursday. I rewatched Gladiator on Monday. Uh, quite the movie, pretty violent, but uh, good insight into the Roman mentality at the time. If you've seen the movie Gladiator, uh, the Roman legionnaire tattoo that every soldier received, SPQR, stands for Senatus Populusque. Romanus for the Senate and the people of Rome. So that is what they were fighting for, the Senate and the people of Rome. However, over the years, the Senate became more and more corrupt, moving away from an elected republic and moving more towards a semi-dictatorship led by the most powerful of senators. Now, as Rome was increasing in military power, the generals started to gain more and more influence. And one general in particular by the name of Julius Caesar grew so much in power and popularity that many, uh, after many overseas victories, most notably adding France or the Gauls to the Roman uh, Roman Republic, that, that he does the unthinkable. He turns and marches his army right into Rome and starts a civil war. And he took over the entire Republic by force Uh, being elected as the lone dictator of the Senate. Now, there is some debate whether he's actually the last dictator of the Senate or the first emperor of an empire. He's right at that pivot point. However, on March 15th, 44 BC, it's called the Ides of March, he was assassinated by several senators. Now, three of Julius Caesar's main supporters declared war on the Senate and the assassins. So now we've got a complete civil war. 
We have the supporters of Julius Caesar. We have those who are pushing for the Senate, and they now are at war. Uh, the main supporters eventually overthrow the Senate, and one of them, Julius Caesar's adopted son by the name of Octavius, declares the Republic disbanded and declares Rome as an empire ruled by a single emperor and declares himself as the very first Roman emperor in 27 BC, so 27 years before Jesus was born. He is then given the name, instead of Octavius, he's given a new name, Caesar Augustus. Augustus means like revered and honoured, which is where, incidentally, we get the name of the month August from uh, in our calendar. Now, you may remember that it was Caesar Augustus, the very first Roman emperor, who called for the census to be taken throughout the empire that meant that Mary and Joseph travelled all the way down to Bethlehem and where Jesus was born. So his desire to take an account over how many people he ruled over ended up putting into place, putting into you know, motion the prophecies to be fulfilled of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. So from a small tribe to a, to a monarchy, to a democratic republic, to an empire. Now, this might sound familiar. If you think it sounds a little bit like Star Wars, you are correct. Uh, Star Wars obviously took a lot of this tension between a uh, Senate, a Republic, and the Empire and made, you know, a bazillion dollars out of it. Anyway, all well and good, you may say, but what does Caesar Augustus have to do with what a gospel is? I'm glad you asked that question as well. Because Mark borrowed the word gospel from Caesar Augustus himself. The word gospel in Greek is euangelion, which means good news. Now, Augustus decreed his euangelion, his gospel, to be proclaimed throughout the Roman Empire long before Mark used the word to describe the life of Jesus. An inscription found in Prien in modern Turkey refers to Caesar Augustus by saying this, the birthday of Augustus has been for the whole world the beginning of the gospel, the euangelion concerning him. I'll read that again. The birthday of Augustus has been for the whole world the beginning of the euangelion concerning him. Now this inscription was found on a government building dating from about 6 BC. And here's more of what it says, which gives us insight into how the Romans understood the gospel concerning Caesar Augustus. This is more in the same building. The most divine Caesar we should consider equal to the beginning of all things. For when everything was falling into disorder and tending towards dissolution, he restored it once more and gave the whole world a new aura. Caesar, the common good fortune of all, the beginning of life, and vitality. All the cities unanimously adopt the birthday of the divine Caesar as the new beginning of the year. Whereas the providence which has regulated our whole existence has brought our life to the climax of perfection and given to us the Emperor Augustus, who being sent to us and our descendants as Savior, has put an end to war and set all things in order. And whereas having become God manifest, Caesar has fulfilled all the hopes of earlier times. Right? That's the gospel of Caesar Augustus. He's the beginning of life. The calendar starts afresh with him. He is Rome's savior. He's bringing peace and order and good fortune. His gospel declares that he is the manifestation of God himself. His coins would bear the inscription, Savior of the world. The birthday of Augustus has been for the whole world the beginning of the gospel concerning him. The beginning of the gospel concerning him. Now, how does Mark open up his account again about the life of Jesus? Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Written to Christians in Rome, suffering death and torture at the hands of the latest Roman emperor. Mark wanted his hearers to ask the question, so who truly has the gospel? Augustus? Nero? They seem to hold the power, or does Jesus have the gospel? And if so, then what is the gospel? What is the euangelion? What is the good news? Now, is the good news uh, about power and might? Because Rome's 
armies dominated all other armies at the time. Is the good news that uh, that Rome are is politically, financially, and mil militarily the dominant nation? Is that the good news? That through their subjugation they bring peace to other nations, the so-called Pax Romana. Therefore, you should bow down and worship Caesar. If that is true, then the Roman ethos of might makes right should be your life motto. You should be the one seeking to dominate rather than be dominated. That you should use whatever means available to you to climb as high as you can within your lifetime. Those are very Roman values. And yet, we're going to read about a carpenter, not a general. About a teacher, not a Caesar. We're going to read about love and sacrifice, not domination and subjugation. We're going to read about God himself, not just a man. We're going to read a very different gospel than Caesar Augustus's. Now, why does any of this matter to you today? That's a really good question. I'm glad you've asked that one as well. In our day and age, Canada, 2022, the overriding philosophy is not one of domination. Thank goodness for that. Attitudes of domination and brutality are being rejected. The residential school system, for example, rejected and condemned as they should be. Racism rejected. Sexism is being rejected. But what is being exalted and commended is the highest good then. What is the gospel of our age? What is our culture saying is the way to peace and prosperity and the good life? We've talked about this before. In this postmodern world, the highest goals of life, the most fulfillment to be found, the purpose of your existence, the place where you can find your own Pax Romana, is through the identification and expression of your inner desires. That is what our postmodern culture would say. Now, philosopher and TV star RuPaul put it this way. When you become the image of your own imagination, it's the most powerful thing you can ever do. Be yourself. Look deep in your heart. Find what is there, desires, longings, etc., and craft your own identity from that. So the gospel of Jesus was in direct opposition to the gospel of Caesar Augustus. And in many ways, it is in direct opposition to our current philosophy of loving yourself first and expressing your inner desires and crafting your own identity and placing yourself on the throne of your own life. The gospel of Jesus is in opposition to Augustus's gospel because Jesus came not to dominate but to love. And it's in opposition to today's gospel because Jesus came to serve others, not to put his own self-interest and self-expression first. He came to sacrifice for others. So love, not domination, a shocking idea for the Roman culture. Self-sacrifice for others not self-expression of your own desires, a shocking idea for our culture, which is incredibly narcissistic in nature. Our Canadian culture might be different from Rome's, but we are equally confronted with the same question. Which gospel will you follow? Which road leads to life? Where do you find meaning and purpose? How do I orient my life? Philippians chapter 2 puts it this way. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Chapter 2 and verse 3 onwards. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, Augustus and the entire Roman culture encouraged you to fight and claw and climb your way to achieve as much power as you could throughout your life, dominate others with that power, so that in death you'll be remembered as a hero. That was the gospel of the day. 
And yet Jesus, who as God of the universe actually had all the power, chose not to use it for his own advantage. Instead, he became a human in order to save everyone else. And our day, our culture says, dig deep within yourself and meet those desires, fulfill those urges, craft your own way in life, create and express your own identity. That's today's gospel in Canada, 2022. And yet Jesus didn't come to craft his own identity or to fulfill his urges or his desires. He came to serve others, to live for others, to die for others, to love others, to put others before himself. He didn't self-express he self-sacrificed. So which gospel are you going to cling to? Domination of others? Self-expression? Or the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Look again at what Paul says here, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. It sounds to me like the Roman gospel. And do nothing from vain conceit. That sounds to me like the Canadian gospel. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So the question is, are you ready to be part of that kingdom? Are you ready to walk contrary to both the Roman, ancient Roman gospel and the postmodern Canadian gospel? Are you ready to walk in the footsteps of Jesus? Because Mark is telling us in, a, in the very first verse of his book that there is a different gospel, a different way, the Jesus way, God's way. And over the next weeks and months, we're going to listen to what the Holy Spirit said to all of humanity throughout all of time, including us, through John Mark, as told to him by the Apostle Peter about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now that sermon was just the first verse of the gospel. Next week, we'll look at verse 2. At this rate, we might be listening to the gospel of Mark for the next 50 years, which actually might not be a bad thing at all. Next week, we're going to explore another thought. that Not only did John Mark borrow the imperial word euangelion, gospel, uh, to describe his message about Jesus, he took this political word that was used by the emperors and he turned it on its head but he also borrowed not only did he take that word but he also borrowed a genre of writing a type of writing called the ancient greco-roman form of biography to explain who jesus was now genre is super important if you think about fairy tales uh they start with once upon a time and if you were to hear a story or watch a movie or read a book and it opens up with once upon a time you have a fair idea of what is going to happen in that story you know, giants and magic and maybe uh, princesses and princes and, and dragons and witches and all kinds of things. And then it's probably going to end and they all lived happily ever after. Fairy tale, you know what to expect by the genre. Uh, same if you listen to a country music song, first few, you know, steel guitar twangs, the first line about a pickup truck. Maybe you know it's going to be about fishing and about dogs and maybe about a girlfriend or a heartache or a breakup or something, you know. There's certain um, content that follows with an expectation of genre. And it's the same with the autobiography, the ancient Greco-Roman uh, genre of autobiography. Is Mark, if it becomes evident that Mark is using this genre of writing, there are certain expectations that come along with that genre. But as we're going to find... Mark also turns those on his head, and that has a meaning in itself as well. So Mark's going to do something very surprising with that genre. You'll have to tune in next week to find out. All right, thanks for joining us in the first sermon, in the brand new sermon series, Gospel of Mark, chapter 1 and verse 1. Have a great week. Bye-bye.